Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for being with us in Ultra Rare Track. Uh, so, um, like, let me start in the interest of time. Hopefully, I can. Yeah. Okay. So I'm doing the right thing. So the first thing what Jenny said after Dylan has been diagnosed, uh, they were trying to do is to find another person with the same condition. And still after nine years post-diagnosis, uh, Dylan is a number of one. And so we all know uh, how rare is a number of one. But how rare is ultra-rare? or hyper-rare, or nano-rare, or ultra-ultra, <laughs> where it starts to be commercially not viable uh, disease or commercially not interesting condition. In the preparation for this session, uh, I just run several search through public available information, and you see how different stakeholders define ultra-rare. And these stakeholders are involved in every medical product development approval reimbursement at use at different stages, right? So they apply different categories to ultra-rare in their decision-making and actions. So what does it mean for us? It means that ultra-rare is a gray space, that's the first thing. Uh, there is no legal definition for ultra-rare that, that is aligned between multiple stakeholders and the world desperately needs a platform, a model to address unmet need regardless of rarity. So where, sorry, wrong button. Um, so where we end now, uh, we run a search through PubMed and from millions and millions of publications we were able to find only 152 articles related to ultra-rare. So we combine it with 29 focused interviews of key stakeholders and decision makers working in the space and we identified several areas, like grouped areas of open questions. And you can see that it's all about high met need Expectation as an expert, system required flexibility, distinction or recognition, evidence and added value challenge uh, to present. So you may say that the same issues apply to rare with higher prevalence. Uh, it's true, though there is there is a question, right? Uh, with rare, um, in rare with higher prevalence, you still have two phases where you collect evidence and where you treat the patient. In ultra in most of the cases, these two phases are going in parallel. So you actually collect evidence and provide access to treatment to the patient at the same time. And this approach requires uh, incredible flexibility and creativity among stakeholders in designing the protocols, in making this evidence um, enough for approval, enough for access, and enough for use. So, I keep saying the wrong button. So, as a result of all these challenges, we see unique opportunities and initiatives happening around ultra-rare, such as platform approach, right, or non-profit initiatives. Uh, uh, Dr. Hastali will speak about MDA Kickstart program. We heard Dr. Marx talking about bespoke consortium. We had a lot of discussions about translational science. Dr. Alan Beggs uh, spoke earlier today. Um, and we have multiple platforms for real-world evidence and real-world data available to support different pieces of diagnosis, evidence package, approval, and post-follow-up. Is it enough? So, let's review. Um, all these initiatives are focused on accelerating the time to the patient, um, improve the efficiency, and de-risk the approach. Right? So, if you will look into the average, like it's simple mathematics, uh, it's 7 to 15 years average to diagnosis for the patient with the condition. It's average 12 years for rare orphan medical product to be approved, and then it's average 2 to 15 years of a follow-up, especially if you are working in gene therapy. Um, all initiatives that are happening now around ultra-rare are focused on cutting the first part of the time, right, so like ex expediting diagnosis and expediting start of the, uh, start of the research. There are several platforms that um, their goal is actually to do 12 years in less than one. Let's see how it will be. 
And then there are several additional acceleration opportunities like regulatory scheme or early access scheme that will uh, allow you to cut from days to years. And then there are several opportunities to expedite approval and expedite access. So what does it mean? There is a pressure in time from both sides. And the tricky part in it is that the level of evidence and the level of added value didn't change. So less time doesn't mean that you have to present less evidence in your dossier or package submission. It means just additional pressure for you to generate this evidence and added value in shortened time. Okay. So when we reviewed uh, what are the key issues in developing ultra rare, we selected several products um, who actually mitigated risks and mitigated them successfully. So I will not read all the slide, I will just put it for your information and you can review it by yourself. What I wanted to share with this slide is that actually 14 medications out of the list who have ultra-rare conditions in their label were included as most expensive drugs in 2020 and 2021. And that's uh, official statistics. Okay. Uh, when I spoke with Elia, uh, another parent of mine who has a child with an ultra-rare condition, she told that our life changed overnight. Okay? So these people, these families, life changes overnight. Do we do enough to support a change and to support them to live better life? At the consortium, we reviewed retrospective data of every ultra-rare medical product that has been approved, reimbursed or used. Uh, we spoke with experts and we evaluated available evidence. We identified over 200 issues that are leading to a failure in the process of development, approval, reimbursement and use when you deal with ultra-rare medical product. And we run these 200 issues uh, with, through the most significant change technique, it's modeling, right? So like what as of minimum you can do in order to receive maximum result and the rest will follow. And you see that these categories are grouped per diagnosis, development, approval, access and follow-up. There are several categories, several things to follow during each of this phase, right? So across the life cycle of medical product. And we talked about several measures during the conference already. Uh, so we spoke about like master protocols or like required new golden standard for development. We spoke about uh, adaptive designs or statistics. We spoke about um, newborn screening, but there is also a lack of complex diagnosis scenarios. Uh, we spoke about approval to platforms as a single product. Um, didn't touch any conditional approval or temporary license. Um, but we definitely touch uh, greater cooperation among regulatory agencies and potential to um, take and implement data uh, generated from different countries. Um, so there are several things in access and follow-up that I wanted to share with you because for most of the people with ultra-rare condition, the first option is for off-label use and usually this off-label use has issues in enough safety or appropriate safety, efficacy and dosing information and uh, not enough coverage, right? So like if we want to change this option now, option one, we have to guarantee we have to guarantee this. The second option is usually repurposed drug, right? So which is a cocktail of medications for symptom treatment. And usually this repurposed drug do not impact or decrease the quality of life. So if we want to, to, to do a change, we need to do better to improve the quality of life of a patient. So I will not read it all again. I will leave it for, for you, for you as a material, but I wanted to I wanted to summarize 10 things to consider, right? So which is very important. For everyone working in ultra-rare, we need to consider that the system is designed primarily to care about adults and more common diseases and not about children with progressive ultra-rare, right? The regulatory landscape reflects uh, innovation in science and technology, but there is always a delay and delay is different per area. 
Early collaboration with key stakeholders may help you to negotiate adaptive clinical design and protocol and adaptive statistics, but you have to start really early. Um, patients, for, uh, patients for clinical trials have huge variability, so most often you will not have enough cohort to compare. Right. And then another issue that because of this high variability, the medical product will present different results at different patients, so most probably you will not have so-called clinically meaningful effect. So you need to explain it to regulators, to payers, and everyone who will make decisions about your medical product. Um, quantifiable endpoints and scales may be applicable to the patient, but maybe not and not all ultra-rare conditions will be covered by natural history study or disease registry or structured data collection. So you need to be ready that there, we, that there will be a need for a wider outcome, discussion and implementation. Um, you have to build early um, a multi-stakeholder network because usually it starts early with translational science and then later in the stage you go to industry partner or pre-licensing agreements. Uh, knowing the burden of, this, of disease is a key. Uh, burden of disease is health economics, so what is the true impact of the disease on patient, family and society? Because, believe me or not, sooner or later you will all have questions about cost efficiency, cost benefit and cost utility. Approval does not equal access. Uh, it takes from three months to 36 months, according to our analysis, from approval to actual, uh, to actual um, access to the patient in US, Canada, UK and European countries. So it varies per country, but still from three months to 33 months. And then finally, a number of recognized ultra-rare diseases keep growing. So unless we will find a solution, or there will be a huge unmet need and we will be always late. I didn't include here one more point, but I think it's very important. Based on the consortium work, we identified often cases where the failure of a medical product, it was not clear if this is because of the biological effect, lack of biological effect, or it's because of inappropriate design of the clinical trial and unrealistic expectation to the evidence. So this is something that we really also need to work on and be absolutely sure that drug failure is because the lack of biological effect. And as always, I have a huge list of references used in the presentation if you would like to go and um, review more details. And I want to end that there are patients who simply cannot wait. And these patients, their families and their caregivers are the best who will determine if the drug actually changes the quality of life and adds value or not. Thank you. We have time for a panel. A pretty, we should probably have a reasonable amount of time for that panel. So we can save questions for the end when all the speakers come up. Um, okay. Okay, I've been warned about this clicker, so hopefully I'm on top of it. Um, so I'm going to talk to you now about uh, what we're doing at MDA around ultra-rare disease. Um, so we're an umbrella organization, I think as most of you know, that we cover uh, multiple ultra-rare diseases. Um, we say that we cover over 45 neuromuscular diseases, but really those are categories of diseases. And as we've learned more and more and identified more and more genes, you know, these have clearly grown. So, you know, in the limb girdles, we ran out of letters in the alphabet and had to switch to numbers. Uh, Charcot-Marie tooth keeps going up. Uh, mitochondrial myopathy, just Lee syndrome alone, I think there's over 40, 50 mutations that can cause that disease. So we track about 330 where any of these diagnoses can be seen at an MDA care center as a neuromuscular disease. There are probably honestly closer to 600 neuromuscular diseases. And the important thing about this is that when you look at them, there's probably only maybe 17 to 20, so it's hard to get numbers on some of these, that actually affect more than 1,000 people in the United States. And that means that the vast majority of our portfolio is ultra rare. And uh, our mission isn't just to develop treatments and cures for SMA, Duchenne, and ALS. It really includes the whole portfolio. So we've taken a step back now that there, are a pretty, there is a pretty good pipeline for some of these more common diseases, more common rare 
what can we do about the less common diseases in our program? So when we look at drivers, this is, you know, you heard the complex version from Marina <laughs> about, about where the issues and problems are in the system. This is my version. Looking at the drivers, on one side you have things that push, and those in this case are primarily families living with ultra-rare disease. So I have taught personally to many families who are basically building biotech companies in their kitchens. They are calling researchers, they're finding mouse models, they're reading papers, they're becoming their own experts. And they're, you know, they call us seeking advice, you know, how can we move this to the next step? So that's one push. Of course, we have investigators, and you've heard from several of them already in this track, who are studying these ultra-rare diseases and trying to find therapies to push forward in foundations like MDA and others that are also pushing. In a, a different disease that's more common, you might also have a strong pull, and that's industry, who sees a potential um, commercial viability for these diseases. So you see that in Duchenne and SMA and some of these others, where you do have a lot of companies working. In this case, it's a really small pull. It's not a big pull. And you have a strong push. And that push is uh, from potential payers. And it, it, you know, it, it's not an, a blatant, we don't want to do this, but there's this frisson of unease about what's going to happen with these disorders. You saw the chart that Marina put up. They tend to be in the highest price drugs. Because with a small market, when you can't scale the cost of development to match your market, you have to increase the, the price of the drug. Um, so these aren't balanced. Right now, there's a much stronger push than there is a pull, and we have to figure out what we can do about these different um, stick figures on my drawing. Um, here we go. Oops, I got overexcited. Hold on. So, you know, we looked at some short and long-term things that we could do. Um, short-term, I will talk to you about the Kickstart program, but we also talked about we can increase the availability of patient data um, through our mover patient database. So we've talked about doing a more general case report form. So we collect data right now in seven indications. They're all in that top, you know, 20 more common rare. But we could do a more general case report form to just start collecting data on these ultra-rare diseases so we can at least capture it. Um, a lot of the ultra-rares are seen in our care centers, so we can start following these, even if we don't have the indication-specific details that you might get in others. Um, we can also issue requests for applications for ultra-rare projects. So that's something else we can do to at least fund this at the academic level. Ultimately, the longer-term strategies are probably going to be necessary. Um, we are working with consortiums like Marina's Five Voices Consortium to have a sort of united front with the FDA and say these are probably regulatory changes that need to happen. And those will have to go through specific mechanisms like, you know, PDUFA reauthorizations or chances where you can impact how those regulations are made. We heard Peter Marks this morning give a talk that sounded very encouraging. I read that as a laundry list of things that he would like to see in the next PDUFA reauthorization. He can't lobby for the FDA himself. But he also can't make that happen necessarily at the uh, FDA without some legislative push for that. Um, there may even be options to do things like uh, leaving an IND open. You know, I worked on a, a clinical trial for giant axonal neuropathy when I was um, at Pfizer, and it was in, shared with NIH. And there were 40 patients in that study, and well, there were probably 40 patients identified in the United States, and half of them, over half of them, were being treated in the study. And we made enough vector. This was a gene therapy trial to treat everyone alive. But to get that approved, we were going to have to do three commercial batches. And the thing about commercial manufacturing is it's not scalable. It's, you, can't, it, you can't do a small commercial batch. And so it was just, it's really hard to imagine what you would do. In that case, maybe you leave that IND open. Maybe you don't have it approved. And then you have to fundraise for every dose for a patient. Um, I don't think that's the best solution, but I think that's kind of default what's happening in some cases. And finally, you know, legislation of action might be the way to go. Um, certainly increasing incentives. The pediatric voucher, the rare pediatric voucher, is one of the few things out there that's actually a pull. It clearly won't work for adult ultra-rare diseases. Um, and there's always this concern about whether that's going to be reauthorized and whether people are misusing it. So that's another concern. Um, so just to focus on this first short-term option, um, so what is Kickstart? So we said, what can we do in the short term? We wanted to do something that was like a test case to say, 
if we look across that big portfolio of disorders, can we identify something that's sort of technically low-hanging fruit? So a disease that is a recessive, uh, straightforward gene replacement um, that technically looks quite doable, a high unmet medical need, and that the major barrier is just the commercial, the lack of commercial viability. Um, you know, we had some in internal experience on our staff in gene therapy, so I've worked at both Pfizer and Aspio and Bamboo Therapeutics in project lead in gene therapy, and my colleague, Dr. Angela Leck, who's our VP for research, has also had experience in gene therapy. We teamed up with Marina, who's our project lead, um, to help work on this as well. So that was the modality we chose um, because we had that internal expertise. And so we are functioning a little bit like a biotech startup. So in licensing the IP that we need um, and then putting together all the pieces of the team and sort of outsourcing what we need to. So whether it's a sponsored research agreement with the university or a manufacturing contract with a CRO, toxicology, we can outsource that and pull these pieces together. Um, this is just our team and just some idea. This is what our experience looks like. So, um, so here's a little bit about the selection process. So we actually did this fairly methodically. We sort of divided all of these uh, different criteria for technical, clinical, and commercial together. Um, this was actually a spreadsheet that I had developed um, when I was in industry where we used to weight the commercial side more heavily. Um, we filled this out and basically disregarded the commercial for the most part and said, what can we find that's got a good technical and clinical path? So we sort of evaluated indications in light of each of these different criteria and um, organized them in different ways. Is that one minute? Is that what you're holding up? Okay. Um, all right, so I'll be fast. So I will just jump to the case, and we're going to hear a little bit about this in a, in a minute, but we selected a congenital myasthenic syndrome. Um, called CHAT deficiency. So it's a deficiency of choline acetyltransferase. And I, it was a really good uh, indication from the standpoint that this is a small gene. It fits in AAV. Um, it can be delivered intrathecally, so it would look something like the same delivery you would see in spinal muscular atrophy. So there's a path forward there. And it, when you think about it, this is a case where muscles aren't degenerating. The nervous system isn't degenerating. You just have to reconnect that communication at the neuromuscular junction and with the potential to make a great impact. So I'm not going to say more about that because I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Maselli in a minute who's going to talk more about this indication. Um, but just to say here very quickly, we decided to focus early in the process on the pre-IND submission um, because there are some mechanisms. The NIH bespoke gene therapy and NINDS's urgent program that could move it forward from there. But they were finding that their applications weren't complete enough. They weren't getting really well-polished projects. We said, we don't care about that. We'll take something that has high potential and polish it. So we're focused on this uh, pre-IND stage and making sure that we have a really good meeting with the FDA where we get feedback that's really actionable and that we come in with enough data that they can give us good feedback. Um, so uh, just to say we also have an oversight committee that you can see here and then a project team. Um, oops. Okay, and then just finally how to scale this, right? So if we do these one-off and we're looking at 600 potential indications, clearly this would be a long process. But I think it's scalable from the standpoint of, you know, one, if we set up master service agreements with CROs, and uh, manufacturers and we have project managers, we can run our internal project, but we can have some excess capacity that we could make available possibly to those families running the biotechs around the kitchen or, you know, companies always have things in their pipeline. They acquire something, they end up with one or two ultra rare things. It shows up on their website in the pipeline, but we all know it's not really moving forward. Well, maybe we can partner with you to help move that forward. Um, and also for investigators doing ultra rare. And, the other thing that's important, too, is we're documenting all this as we go. So we're working with Marina. You see, she's very methodical. She likes to document stuff. So as we go through this process, we will, we will share and publish as we go. Where are the obstacles and how did we overcome them and try to contribute to the literature there? Um, so thank you, and that's all for me. And I all right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to take this time first to uh, thank the uh, Muscular Dystrophy Association for inviting me to present uh, 
a preclinical study on uh, congenital myasthenic syndrome due to the efficiency of cholinacetyltransferase. And uh, I realized that this is really uh, just one very rare disease in the ocean of multiple rare diseases. So uh, this is not really, it's just an example of one tackling one disease and hopefully this approach may serve as a platform to kind of streamlining future studies and in, in working for gene therapy for the ultra rare diseases. Um, so um, I've been at the University of uh, California, Davis for many, many years. My interests are congenital myasthenic syndromes, which are really most of them are ultra rare diseases. So uh, this is really my field of expertise and work. And, uh, and so um, I, let's see if I keep, all right, so here we go. So um, we heard a lot about uh, gene therapy for uh, neuromuscular diseases in this meeting. And the concept is very straightforward, uh, a viral vector tran 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 transferring a gene, a healthy gene, into a target cell. And the target cell, once the, 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 the vector is introduced in the cell, uses the uh, ribosomal machinery to uh, translate the gene that is transporting. And so that gene is uh, producing, translating the protein continuously. And for, the, for all what we know, we can do that I indefinitely. And so um, this particular approach has been used on multiple levels in neuromuscular diseases. And uh, starting with a motor neuron, and I don't have to introduce to you Sol Jensman. This is an epitome of, uh, of success on this particular approach. Uh, Sharon uh, mentioned about giant, giant axonal neuropathy, which is now there is a current clinical trial on that. And, uh, and then the, uh, at the, mus uh, the level of the muscles, there are several uh, types of muscular dystrophies at various levels of uh, development using the AEV technology. So uh, the logical next, uh, next uh, uh, level of uh, uh, of, um, of treatment is a neuromuscular junction. You know, neuromuscular junction is a site of abundant genetic pathology. And those are the congenital myasthenic syndrome, my areas of interest. And as I said, most of them are ultra rare diseases. Um, and uh, there are close to uh, 35 genes with association with congenital myasthenic syndromes. And so this is a really a very complex uh, area. Uh, gene therapy has been tried at the preclinical stage, uh, mainly in Japan, uh, for two types of congenital myasthenic syndromes. One uh, due to DOC7 deficiency in Dr. Yamanashi's laboratory, and COLQ deficiency in the laboratory of Kinji Ono. And uh, with very with good success, um, and as I said, it's really a very complex area. But one way to the, to uh, classify congenital myasthenic syndromes is in presynaptic and postsynaptic. And the, the the important issue here is that the genes encoding presynaptic congenital myasthenic syndromes are encoded in in the motor neurons. Whereas those in the postsynaptic congenital myasthenic syndromes are encoded in the muscle, uh, in the muscle nucleus. So, and that really, that differentiation is really very important because that will determine the type of serotype that we select in order to proceed with the gene therapy, which is mainly dictated by the caps capsid of the, of the gene. And not only that, it will determine, second, the route of administration. Okay, so it will be different if it is a presynaptic versus a postsynaptic. And finally, and most important, it will kind of warn us about the potential organ toxicity of the, of the gene therapy that we will establish. So we, uh, 
selected choline acetyl transferase as a, as, a, as a site for the repair with gene therapy because this is really a fundamental enzyme. Participates in the synthesis of acetylcholine at from choline that is um, reabsorbed from the extracellular space through a high affinity transporter and from acetylcholine A that mainly derives from the mitochondrial metabolism. So CHAT synthesizes acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is introduced in the synaptic vesicles through the vesicle acetylcholine transporter. So vesicle acetylcholine transporter and the transporter of choline also can result in congenital myasthenic syndromes. But the, by far the most common is the one that results from uh, def deficiency of the choline acetyl transferase. The thing in common with all of them is that all of those genes are translated in the soma of the motor neuron. Okay, so they are translated here and they are transported through the anterograde uh, axonal flow to the nerve terminal. So they express with muscle fatigability and weakness, but in reality, is our diseases fundamentally are diseases of the motor neuron because the gene is, fun is translated in the motor neuron. So we um, reasoned that if uh, AAV therapy is so successful for a motor neuron disease, it should be also successful for congenital myasthenic syndromes, presynaptic form of congenital myasthenic syndromes. You can argue actually it may be even more successful because those are not progressive diseases, right? So um, just a few words about the disease, the human disease, congenital myasthenic syndrome associated with episodic apnea, secondary to mutations to choline acetyltransferase gene. Again, this is an ultra-rare disease. It's about 5 to 10% of congenital myasthenic syndromes which themselves are really very rare. So we are talking about maybe a few hundred in the United States, so for sure less than 500, so really talking about ultra-rare disease, perhaps several thousands in, in globally in the whole world. Uh, symptoms of weakness and fatigability, and this particular association with episodes of apnea. And that makes this disease a dreadful disease. In fact, uh, we have lost two children with this disease due to, episode, due to, uh, to uh, respiratory, respiratory failure. Um, two forms of presentation, one with onset very early in life. An example here with a neonatal onset is like in the TK2 uh, presentation before the earlier the disease starts, the, most, the more severe the disease is. That's exactly the same. Whereas here we have an infantile form in which the disease is not, is not very severe. So maybe I can see you a little bit. Those children, they're, they're on need of tracheotomy, mechanical ventilation, and gastric tube. They have also developmental delay because uh, chat is also needed for the, for the central nervous system. And then compared with this girl, she is really very, very, she's not very weak at all, but she also has episodes, she has two okay. episodes of apnea, and you can see that she has fatigability here, you can see that she developed ptosis here and the in the left eye, okay? So we needed to have um, a model to uh, try uh, the gene therapy that we wanted to test. And uh, so we looked at rodent type of, uh, of uh, deficiency of choline acetyl transferase. And uh, we found this, there, was, there is a, um, a model that was developed at uh, Dr. Sain's laboratory, uh, which is uh, based on LOXP cloned into the chat gene and with these LOXP uh, sites in the presence of uh, Cre recombinase, the LOXP, LOXP size recombine and this segment is excised. That leads to, uh, to a friendship 
and uh, early termination colon and uh, deletion of this particular gene. So the, the way that was developed uh, is actually if you if you um, if this is paired with a with a Cree uh, mouse uh, with a strong promoter, these animals are not viable. So they were really you no know, useful because we couldn't test any therapy on those uh, mice. So in order to go around that, we use a Cree uh, tag with the estrogen receptor. So with, with tamoxifen, we can control in time when we can induce a disease. And so the first step on this, on this research, was to create using uh, tamoxifen in these animals. And, uh, and we, after a lot of trial and error, we determined that using 40 micrograms of tamoxifen per kilogram with two injections at T11 was an excellent time to produce a disease. These animals will last for three or four weeks. It will give us plenty of opportunity for us to uh, test our gene therapy. So the second step was to rescue the animal using using an intracerebral ventricular injection of AAV9, carrying the chat, the human chat gene, okay? And we introduced that with a micropipette, with a patch clamp micropipette, injected in the, in the cerebral hemispheres, uh, with at this particular concentration, which is not very high, is two, ten to the, two times 10 to the 13, which represent about one microliter per ventricles in these in this mice. Um, and I'm going to show you here, you know, putting head to head, one animal that was injected with uh, one mutant animal that was, uh, was not injected with AAV on the left side and one injected with AAV. The one with, uh, with, with non-injected with AAV, after the tamoxifen injection, they developed progressive weakness, loss of weight, then become immobile, and they all with, with, all of them died actually, so with rare exceptions. So, uh, so I can sh you can see it here with this animal. They also developed uh, autonomic failure, so they have fecal impact impactions because they don't have a coding for the peristalt peristaltic movements. Okay, and so you can see the other one here, the one injected, and this particular animal Mouse survived. Female injected with AAV9. Well, you can see the difference is obvious. And uh, so at the point that, at this point, we were really at the peak of the pandemic and we were mandated to uh, go home and to stop all the research. So when we came back to the laboratory, we started doing uh, systematic uh, studies using the rotor rod, using the grip strength test. Rotor rod test is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a wheels that are accelerated, and so we compute the time that the animals can stay in the rods before falling, and the amount of grip strength they can generate. And first of all, the survival was dramatically different here in two, two case is the, uh, in, in greens are the AAV, the tamoxifen are in, in red and the wild type in, in blue. And you can see here that the weight was not, no significant difference between the injected and, and the wild type and the tamoxifen were underweight. The performance and the rotor rod, you can see that they are underperforming the animals injected with tamoxifen. And here this point of inflection is not that they started doing better, it's just simply that most of them were dying. So the only ones that survived were performing a little bit better. So the rotor rod performance overall was, was almost no difference between with the wild type and the grip, grip strength was the same applied for the grip strength. And uh, here where the EMG would perform EMGs before 30 seconds of, uh, of um, uh, continuous stimulation to uh, um, and uh, for 30 seconds and then animals uh, with tamoxifen presented decrement before and after at uh, 30 seconds of uh, stimulation. Um, here at the level of the motor neuron uh, we we look at the expression of the um, of the motor neuron of the uh, of chat in the motor neurons here in the lat in the at the level of the anterior horn of the spinal cord. And you can see here, this is a wild type. 
This is an injected animal, so there's practically no difference. And here, this is an animal injected only with tamoxifen. The, the difference is dramatical, as you can see here. And here's tamoxifen, uh, AAV, and the wild type. And so we wanted to look one year after what happened at the level of the D DNA. So we, di we did a real-time PCR, quantitative PCR, and you can see that even one year after, which for one translated to humans is about age 25, 30, there was a still persistence and close to, in some animals, al almost close to 10 copies of the virus in the per cell, which is quite impressive, you know, quite frankly. And one thing that not totally unexpected, but even in spite that we didn't uh, inject systemically, there was some virus also expressed in the liver. So no matter what or what you do, everything ends up in the liver, <laughs> so you have to be careful. But nevertheless, this is really something very good if you can do directly in inf uh, injection to avoid the liver toxicity. So I have data on, the, on RNA, that we, this is a work in progress, but I can tell you that after one year, there's still very robust expression of the gene at the level of the motor neurons. Um, so finally, the final point, this is my last slide. Uh, this is a concern, we have a lot of concern about what we can do. I'm just trying to echo what was discussed this morning. We want to go fast. But on the other hand, we want to be safe, right? And we don't want to, because ultimately we're going to give this to patients and we want to make sure that we're not producing cancers, inflammatory disorders, and that sort of things. And I was concerned about cancer because using stem cells in the past, I produced tumors in, in, in mice, and so I didn't want to see. And then that's really was very, very good that the fact that we didn't see any form of cancer at all, we didn't see any kind of inflammation at the level of the liver, we didn't see any, any inflammatory responses, and this was reviewed uh, also by a veterinarian pathologist, which did, he didn't, she didn't see any pathology at all. I looked also at, at the DRC, dorsal root ganglia, because we want to make sure there was no inflammatory uh, reaction at the level of the DRC and there was not any. And then we, um, we looked also at the heart to make sure there was no um, myocardial pathology and there was not any. So here's my, my summary. So AAV chat can rescue a lethal phenotype of chat knockout mice. Okay, so that's the first conclusion. It can restore the expression of the chat enzyme in cholinergic neurons and it can restore and the gene expression remains for quite a long time, and it does, most importantly, it does without causing any apparent uh, toxicity. So the obvious conclusion, this may represent a, a promising therapy for patients with, with chat mutations um, uh, associated with congenital myasthenic syndromes associated with uh, episodic apneas due to chat mutations. Thank you very much.